ugly reality of religious tension in Nigeria today. A church bombed by Boko Haram, the radical Islamist group based in northern Nigeria. Acts like these are condemned by the mainstream Islamic leaders in Nigeria. But some Christians in Nigeria are still fearful of what will happen long term. It's not often discussed in public, but privately many here talk about a future division of the country. Religion is a sensitive issue in Nigeria, a country which for a long time prided itself for being the greatest Islamo-Christian nation in the world. They are now fears that the anger and frustration at the rising insecurity could lead to a resurgence of violence between Muslims and Christians. What about the situation in the larger region? What will happen if extremism in the word of religion continues to spread on the continent? and what is the position of the Catholic Church on other issues like gay rights. One of the leading Catholic figures in Africa is this man. He's a real insider in the Catholic Church too, often referred to as a potential Pope. Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, religion and politics with Cardinal John Onaika. Cardinal John Onaika, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you for welcoming us in your home. Thank you very much for coming. For extremist groups like Boko Haram, there is a holy war going on in Nigeria. Is the current crisis we're seeing a case of religious extremism, in your opinion, or religion being manipulated for political gain? The part of it that is most distressful and sad is that um, religion, which in itself is a very noble thing, gets then misused, while people with sincere conviction pursue a certain way of behavior, which in their heart of hearts they really believe in. The spiritual leader of the Muslim, the Sultan of Sokoto, has condemned Boko Haram and taken distance for them, from them, but you've said that this is not enough. What more do you expect? The Muslim community must do more than just condemning them. We must take concrete, effective, proactive steps to reach out to them. To reach out to Boko Haram. Boko Haram, yes. And, not, and uh, I do not know how they will do it. But my own conviction is that uh, uh, it doesn't help to deny that Boko Haram doesn't belong to the to the house of Islam. The head of the Anglican Church in Nigeria has said that he thinks that the Sultan of Sokoto secretly supports Boko Haram. So, I mean, it seems that... And here, I thoroughly disagree with my brother, Archbishop, for the simple reason that I have no reason to doubt the sincerity mm. of the Sultan. So what is your relationship then like with the Muslim community? Are you working together with the Sultan to address this threat of Boko Haram? It is, well, it is well known that the Sultan and I are good friends. Also because we share a lot of common vision about Nigeria and about the role of religion in this country. Uh, and uh, I respect his views. He knows my, that I'm a Christian. I'm not only a Christian, I'm an archbishop and a cardinal. And I know he is uh, he's not only a Muslim, but he is the head of all Muslims in Nigeria. But we both agree that that does not, could not stop us from being able to put our heads together mm -hmm. and make this country a place where all Nigerians can live in peace. There are many people who believe that when Boko Haram targets Christian churches or uh, Western model schools, they're not doing so out of mere hatred of Christianity or of the West, they're doing so for more basic reasons, and that is to protest the North's feeling of marginalization, which they felt for a very long time, uh, more poverty in the North than in the South, uh, a lack of education for many of the children of the North, unemployment, that fundamentally the only way to address this issue is to address the entrenched poverty 
in the north. Every single group in Nigeria mm. has complained of marginalization in one form or the other. And uh, whatever Boko Haram may be complaining about is not just for their own experience alone. It's experience that is shared by many all over, all across the land. But, but those in the, in the north mm -hmm. have had a more difficult experience, wouldn't you agree? What would they, but every effort has been made all this time in this country to distribute the resources as far as possible across the nation. In any case, where do you draw the line between north and south? I come from the very middle. <laughs> and uh, in the old days, I would have been a northerner. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I think uh, what, we, what we do, we must really insist on right now, is that whatever may be the complaints and the grievances of those boys carrying guns and bombs, nothing justifies what they are doing. And there are always other ways of addressing the issues that they are raising. And there are other young people who are really suffering, who are suffering the same way, but are working hard to pull themselves out of poverty, out of general neglect. And I hope that what we are seeing now should be like a wake-up call. A wake-up call, wake call, you say? Yes. Let me ask you this, uh, Cardinal. If the objective of Boko Haram, as you've said in the past, is to tear Nigeria apart by pitting Christians against Muslims into a war, and that this objective is being realized, I mean, perhaps not now, but if the situation continues to worsen, it might happen. Do you think then a partitioning of Nigeria along religious lines could be a solution? Let me go back first to the hypothesis of the objective of Boko Haram. For whatever we heard about the objective, uh, the only one we really hear concretely is that they want a, a, an Islamic State. nation that is not just uh, run by any kind of Sharia, but a Sharia according to their understanding of it. Uh, uh, that kind of objective is obviously, for the rest of us, impossible. What do you respond, Cardinal, to those who blame religion for the social economic and political state of Nigeria today? <laughs> I think anyone who, who comes out with a single uh, cause for our problems is likely to be wrong because there's not one single cause for all our problems. Mm -hmm. Whatever may be the role of religion in a negative way, you can also talk about the role of politics. But Nigeria is intensely religious, an intensely religious country where you don't have a separation between church and state. And between mosque and state. Between mosque and state. <laughs> because <laughs> because when, uh, generally, you, when, we, when this discussion start, goes on, it's almost as if it's a Christian issue. But when we talk about secularism, but, but in Nigeria, the expression, yes. It has to be taken on the level of religion and the, and the state. Mm -hmm. And here, I'm sorry to say that there is a whole lot of misunderstanding. And not only that, a whole lot of disagreement. I'm not sure that we all agree on what kind of nation we want as far as the place of religion in the state is concerned. On the one hand, it is obvious that no religion can claim now to be the official religion in Nigeria. And I think the 1999 constitution, following on previous ones, did well to retain that powerful paragraph, uh, paragraph 5 of the constitution, that neither the state nor the federal government shall adopt any religion as state religion. That is well and good. On the other hand, on the other hand, there's religion everywhere. And Nigerians are, uh, are not apologizing for it. The issue is how do we combine uh, this? What does it, how much, what can be, what, how much does a government need to get involved in religion? Mm -hmm. And it will become making religion a, uh, an official religion. Um, most of us Christians would say that the steps taken by the northern governors elevating 
the Sharia law to be a law of their state has precisely gone against the constitution of Nigeria. Now, it's not just in Nigeria, Cardinal, where we're seeing a rise in um, religious uh, radicalism. It's in Mali, it's in Niger, the Sahel region. What do you think are the structural causes uh, of the rise in tide in, in extremist movements in this region of Africa? Unfortunately, religion can easily be used mm. to create a lot of uh, uh, a lot of problems because uh, religious favor is very easily um, stoked up, and that is what we are seeing. What should the regional response be? The international response be to this uh, rising? I wish the governments both in each nation and in the region as a whole, were able to really uh, recognize this as a major problem. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, even the whole issue of Boko Haram, much of the discussion, at least as we are fast, we are seeing, is more concerned with, is more focused on um, how to, um, to coordinate military tactics and uh, resources to uh, tackle right. the, the, but I have not seen enough major effort to think out the issues right. as regards the place of religion in our societies. On the one hand, we don't want to be a godless people. On the other hand, we do not want our religion to become a cause of killing one another. Um, you've been an advocate, Cardinal, for the protection of human rights in Nigeria. And I would like to address a very sensitive issue in Nigeria and in other countries, and that is the issue of homosexuality. Nigeria, along with Uganda, has passed some very tough uh, homosexual laws, anti-homosexual laws. Now, I understand that the Bible and other holy books can be the basis for how we choose to lead our lives. But should they be a basis for how laws are passed? Let me make it very clear that at least I do not know what has happened in Uganda. It is not the, Christ, the churches or the mosques that uh, told the National Assembly to pass the law that they did. But many Nigerians support this law because they believe the Bible says voilà. homosexuality is wrong. For whatever reasons, the law has, has, uh, has the approval of the vast majority of Nigerians. Because they believe is, that the is, Bible says it's wrong. For whatever wrong. reason, Bible, Quran, mm -hmm. the important thing is what the Nigerians want. Is that not the rule of democracy? It is the rule of democracy. It so happens that uh, the, my own church, for example, we are very clear on the matter. We, we believe that homosexuality is a disordered way of, of life. And uh, same-sex marriage is completely unacceptable. Right. So I'm happy that my government... Just on the law. Isn't the passing of this law, though, just a case of misplaced priorities by the Nigerian well, government. Are, are there more urgent, urgent matters there like are Boko Haram very and many, so on? There are very <laughs> many. Look, we do, uh, does the National Assembly need to pass any law on Boko Haram? It's, it's already, the law is there right. already. But are they, are they not want, just Boko Haram necessarily, but they, are, they seem to I be think, other urgent matters I than think, passing uh, a law on homosexuality. I think, unfortunately, I think people who listen and watch book, uh, Al Jazeera should be perhaps told that there, is a, there was a reason why this whole passing of laws came about. Our National Assembly was under intense pressures mm -hmm. from the homosexual lobby to pass laws that would, uh, uh, that would uh, uh, legalize same-sex marriage. We know that. And the, Honorable members of the House of Assembly decided, no, we are not passing any such laws. Mm. And they then went and passed a different law. Personally, personally, I, I do not believe that um, it was, it's, I wouldn't, I don't agree with the um, um, Because what's happening now, 
what's happening now is that homosexuals in Nigeria in many places in Africa are being persecuted, so are being, uh, you know, beaten, even killed in some cases for being homosexuals. Isn't the role of the church also to protect any, these If anybody, these, I, I don't believe that, people. I don't believe that anyone has any right to kill anybody for being a sex homosexual. In fact, no one has any right to kill anybody unless through the proper laws of the, of the nation. And then there's no law in Nigeria that says we should kill homosexuals. Uh, just like many laws are passed and are not really followed up, maybe this will go more or less the same way. But what I want, the point I want to make, which I've made always, is that um, uh, the, I did not think it was even necessary to make a law um, that punishes uh, same-sex marriages. That I, for me, I thought it would be In this case, it's enough. not even about same-sex marriage. It's I, just about being a homosexual. Well, that was the original. The original reason for the law is question of marriage. Uh, for me, I thought it would have been enough just to reaffirm mm. the concept of marriage in Nigeria as a, a union between a man and a woman, and then everything else should be considered not recognized. And for me, that would have been enough. But now I'm not in the National Assembly, and they didn't even ask my advice. Cardinal, don't you think that the Catholic Church position, you know, against, for example, gay marriage, uh, divorce, abortion, is anachronistic in today's world? Isn't the Catholic Church alienating a lot of people by not being in tune with how the world is evolving? <laughs> the Catholic Church has never bothered about following the world as far as moral norms and values are concerned. The Catholic Church and I believe any other true religion, must see its role as leading the world and giving directives on how to live a good life. But aren't you losing followers because... Even if you lose followers, we will not... Will not uh, Jesus Christ, when he said some things, we are told people left, decided not to follow him anymore. And he turned around to his immediate followers and said, Are you, will you two go away? And he said, no, we shall not go. So even if we lose followers, we shall always have many. I will always stay. Pope Francis has inaugurated, it seems, a new era of restraint and modesty in uh, the Catholic Church, in the Roman Curia. Are you following his example? Let me say that I admire Pope Francis because he's lived, he's doing the things that I really want to do, that I hope I am doing, and which I think I will still do even more. I think it, uh, Pope Francis did not just start doing the things he's doing now. As Archbishop of uh, Buenos Aires, he was well known right. to be do very you, free. Do you people. think the pastors in Africa and, and you know, the Catholic Church in Africa in general has heard this message that of simplicity, of being modest and so on? When you think about all the millionaires, millionaire pastors there are in Nigeria. Not, for not instance, in the Catholic Church. Not in the Catholic Church uh -huh. necessarily. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, do you think they're hearing this message? Not just necessarily. Yeah, yeah. I dare say, and I think I know African Catholic bishops and leaders very well. Most, I, I don't know of any multimillionaires among us. And I do think we have a, a, a reasonably, I could say, a, arguably good record in this uh, regard. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, uh, you go to most archbishops' houses, they are very simple affair. Partly too because you are not rich. You cannot be richer than your own people. So if you are a bishop in a poor place, you have to be poor to be able to lead them. It's different for the evangelicals? I am not able to talk for the evangelicals. Mm -hmm. They talk for themselves. Okay. Uh, the, the church's reputation, the Catholic church's reputation has also been affected by uh, the sex scandals, uh, the, the pedophile scandals. In Africa, is, do people, are people concerned about this, or is this something that you're very far removed from this? This doesn't, uh, it, is this something that people are concerned about here? I think one must state very categorically that whatever people may say about whether the, whether the church handles well or not, mm -hmm these um, child abuse cases, it is clear that the church has always condemned them. 
In other words, uh, you could argue how far we have gone in trying to stop it. But the, 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 the position of the church has always been recognition that this is a great, not just a sin, but a great crime that should not take place. That it is taking place is a pity. Now, as for we in Africa, we've always known that those things are wrong. Mm -hmm. And we are doing, we are presuming. Those things don't happen in Africa. No, we can't say that. Just like we know that adultery is wrong and it happens everywhere. Not just um, uh, evil, uh, temptations, happens everywhere. Happens everywhere. There may be a difference, of course, from one place to the other, how it is perceived. Mm. Now, you're an insider of the Catholic Church. What impact is the current Pope having in changing the Korea? Do you think he can succeed in changing the Roman Catholic Church? You know, the people who, you, you are right to say I'm an insider. We who are insiders know very well that the Catholic Church is constantly changing. Mm. We have an expression in our church which we say, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda. Meaning the church is always, must always be reforming itself. We know that these things have been going on within. We might say that Pope Francis may have emphasized certain aspects of it, but that uh, um, because of Pope Francis, we are now going to have a new Catholic church that is totally different from what you had before. I don't even think that is the intention of St. Pope Francis himself. Before Pope Francis was appointed, um, the, the possibility of an African Pope electrified the dialogue. He was appointed. Right. You said before he was appointed. Yeah. But I, I, appointed by God. Yeah. Right. But before his election, maybe. Before, no, but you were right. Right. Yeah, your, your Be, words are before, right. Before, before <laughs> he was appointed he by was... God. And we, and we cardinals went there and, and, elected and we, him. We, we, no, we recognized it. Okay. And Let me ask you this. The possibility of an African Pope has electrified a dialogue about race and the Catholic Church. Your name was at one point mentioned as well as the Cardinal of uh, Ghana, uh, Peter Turkson from Ghana, as a potential pope from Africa. Do you think the Catholic Church is ready for a pope from Africa? Why not? The church has got a cardin African cardinals, and when we go into conclave, it's a, a kind of election that you never have anywhere else in the world, where every elect, every, everybody is a, a candidate. So all of us who went to to the conclave, any of us could emerge as the Pope. And uh, when we, we who were there as Africans, we didn't feel any sense of inferiority. We did not think that they gave us red robes just to please Africans. No, we went there as people who the church, for whatever reason, has decided that we belong to this level of the life of the church. And precisely because of that, we know that uh, it will not be a surprise if an African Pope emerges. Do you think in your lifetime you'll see an African Pope emerge? It depends on how long the Popes long live. <laughs> it depends on how long the Pope lives. But the question that people normally you've, ask... You've seen three Popes in, in uh, your time so already. Have, yes, yeah. we've seen three Popes. We've seen, uh, after an Italian Pope, we have seen a Polish Pope, we have seen a, 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 a German Pope, and we have now seen a, a Latin American Pope. So, we are moving. Africa is next. I don't know about that. I don't know whether Africa is next, but Africa is not excluded. We are always part, we are always eligible. Even before Francis, there was also possibility of an African Pope emerging. Now I think the Catholic Church has, is, would not f consider it uh, anything uh, unheard of if they suddenly woke up one morning and saw the white smoke and the name happens to be that of an African, that would be more or less in line with the way the church is going now, that we are all brothers and sisters in the same family of God. Cardinal Unaiken, thank you so very much for thank talking to us. Thank you for your time. You, you, you went through a lot of things.